repent and turn yourselves from your idols. Traditions of Men in Faith and Practice, Part 1 Catholicism is not the only denomination that is beholden to the traditions of men. In most independent fundamental Baptist church buildings, the traditions of men are religiously followed in faith and practice. Although they often boast, the Bible is our final authority in all matters of faith and practice. Sadly, that is a misrepresentation of reality an untruth, and simply a lie. Why do they call the building itself a church? Why do they call the room where they meet together the sanctuary? Why do they have a stage which they call their altar? Where did the altar call originate? Why do they assign unbiblical titles to men? Why do they teach about bringing tithes into the storehouse and faith promise giving? Why do they separate families by age? Why is all of this done as an incorporated creature of the state? Church. What is the church? The church is made up of born-again Christians. It is a local group or called-out assembly of saved people. This group is the church. The building or place, wherever it may be, that they may meet together is not a church. Acts 2.47 Praising God and having favor with all the people, and the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. Colossians 1.18 And he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have the preeminence. Colossians 1.24 Who now rejoice in my sufferings for you, and fill up that which is behind of the afflictions of Christ in my flesh for his body's sake, which is the church. 1 Corinthians 15.9 For I am the least of the apostles, that I'm not meet to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. Sanctuary A Christian has no physical room called a sanctuary in a building made by man. We who are born again of the Holy Spirit are the temple of the living God. Hebrews 8, 1-2 Now of the things which we have spoken, this is the sum. We have such an high priest, who is set on the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens, a minister of the sanctuary and of the true tabernacle, which the Lord pitched and not man. 1 Corinthians 3.16 Know ye not that ye are the temple of God, and that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you? 2 Corinthians 6.16 And what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? For ye are the temple of the living God. As God hath said, I will dwell in them, and walk in them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Altar A Christian has only one altar, Jesus Christ. He is the altar and the sacrifice. There is a golden altar in heaven, but there is no longer any man-made platform or carpeted stage that is our altar. Hebrews 13, 10-16 We have an altar, whereof they have no right to eat which serve the tabernacle. For the bodies of those beasts, whose blood is brought into the sanctuary by the high priest for sin, are burned without the camp. Wherefore Jesus also, that he might sanctify the people with his own blood, suffered without the gate. Let us go forth therefore unto him, without the camp, bearing his reproach. For here have we no continuing city, but we seek one to come. By him therefore let us offer the sacrifice of praise to God continually, that is, the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to his name. But to do good and to communicate forget not. For with such sacrifices God is well pleased. In modern church building services, a ritual called the altar call is employed 
as a means to save souls. Emotional mood music is often played as the preacher repeatedly pleads with sinners to make a decision and come to the altar to receive Christ and be saved. On the count of three, one, two, three, if that's you, if you want a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, raise your hands. Thank you. Thank you. Awesome. Amen. All right, real quick. Those of you that raise, raise your hand, go ahead. And, everyone, go ahead and close your eyes still. Those of you that raised your hand, look at me. And do me a favor and repeat after me. Ready? Jesus, come into my life. Be my Lord. Be my Savior. I know I've been living life for myself. Forgive me, Lord. But this practice is altogether unbiblical. Just giving you an opportunity to confess him before men. He sees you, a little guy in the back. Little guy, I'm not a midget, he's a he's a child. I mean, I don't want anyone to think I was offending a midget. You don't have to leave this room without Jesus. Come on down to this aisle. Make a commitment to Christ. In the 17 years that I have been pastor of the Potter's House, we have never had a Sunday morning that somebody didn't get saved in 17 years. If we made an altar call, somebody came to Jesus. Anybody else? Historically, the altar call was invented by a Presbyterian evangelist named Charles G. Finney 1792 to 1875. Charles Finney's theology was tainted by Pelagianism, which is heresy. He also taught the doctrine of sinless perfectionism. Finney referred to the altar call as coming to the anxious seat or to the inquiry room. Finney first began using this tactic in his evangelistic services around 1820. D.L. Moody later picked up and refined this method and it was subsequently picked up by Billy Graham. Billy Graham defended his new evangelical methods, stating in a paper he wrote entitled The Christian, that, quote, many psychologists would say it is psychologically sound. I'm going to ask you to get up out of your seat and come and stand in front of the platform and say, by coming, I open my heart to Christ, I open my mind to Christ, I want him to have me. I'm willing to change my lifestyle. Whatever it costs, I'm willing to pay it in order to know that I belong to Christ, that he controls me. Why do I ask you to come forward and stand here publicly? There's something about it, spiritually, scripturally, psychologically coming, that settles it and seals it in your heart. And I'm going to ask you to get up and do just that now. And after you've all come, I'm going to say a word to all of you and have a prayer with you and give you some literature that will help you in your Christian life. If you're with friends and relatives, they'll wait on you. If you've come with a roommate from school, they'll wait or bring them with you. And if you don't want to leave your friend, bring your friend with you. But God has spoken to you. There's a little voice that says you need Christ. You get up and come. We're going to wait on you. Quickly, from everywhere, you come. say, well, Billy, you know, I, I've been baptized. I've been confirmed. I belong to the church. 
That's wonderful. I'm asking you tonight to reconfirm your confirmation vows. I'm asking you to reconfirm those that baptized you in the words that were said when you were baptized. In quote services today, you will hear the emotive music repeating strains from invitational hymns in order to set the mood. The preacher says, with every head bowed and every eye closed, slip up your hand if you need to be saved. Nobody will see you. Slip up your hand. Come forward, and one of our counselors will meet with you in the prayer room. Come forward and do business with the Lord. Come to the altar and receive Christ as your Lord and Savior. Colossians 2.8 Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit, after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. Jesus Christ is the altar. Man cannot now walk to Jesus Christ, nor do they need to meet with him at the bottom of the stage in front of the, quote, church building in order for conversion to occur. Repentance, belief in the gospel, salvation takes place in the heart, not in the inquiry room on the side of the stage where you are led to pray what is called a sinner's prayer. Salvation is a work of God, not an emotional response induced or manipulated by man. Friends, if you prayed that simple prayer, I believe you got born again. Now take your hand, put it on your heart, and close your eyes. Pray this prayer with me. Even the people in the congregation, I want you to repeat this prayer with me, with a loud voice. Please, with a loud voice. I said, with a loud voice. The Bible says that if there is any unforgiveness, that it should be dealt with before praying. Therefore, we release any anger, bad feelings, resentment, or any other wrong attitude before you now. We lay it at your feet and we release and forgive those who have wronged us. I lift up those watching this video and we come into agreement and lift up their eternal salvation. To you who are listening right now, I'm going to ask you to repeat after me. Simply repeat what I say right now and you will be saved. Matthew 11:28. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Jesus is the way, the door, the living water, the bread of life, the resurrection and the life. John 11.25 Jesus said unto her, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. Romans 10.9-10 that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. All of this man-made confusion results in a works-based sideshow, with people trusting in an action, an event, something they did once when they decided to, quote, get saved. Traditions. In these buildings today, they are holding up the traditions of their elders, traditions of men, traditions that they learned in a church building, are you guys ready? Yeah. Yeah. Let's do it. Yeah. or at the seminary, where they paid money to be taught by men how to be a pastor. But Jesus, if it wasn't for you, there would be no salvation. Mark 7, 5-9. Then the Pharisees and scribes asked him, Why walk not thy disciples according to the traditions of the elders, but eat bread with unwashed hands? He answered and said unto them, Well hath Isaiah prophesied of you hypocrites, as it is written, This people honoreth me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. Howbeit in vain do they worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. For laying aside the commandments of God, ye hold the traditions of men as the washing of pots and cups, and many other such like things ye do. And he said unto them, Full well ye reject the commandment of God, that ye may keep your own tradition. Assembly Many who hold to the above traditions of men do scoff at, and even falsely accuse those who choose to meet in house churches. They misapply scripture and say, You're, you're forsaking the assembly. assembly. Hebrews 10:24 through 25 
And let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as ye see the day approaching. So, gathering together with other Christians as a church isn't assembling unless it's done in an official state-incorporated, quote, church building? Do they realize that the New Testament clearly teaches that Christians traditionally met in homes without government permission? Matthew 18.20 For where two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst of them. Romans 16.5 Likewise greet the church that is in their house. Colossians 4.15 Salute the brethren which are in Laodicea and Nymphus and the church which is in his house. Philemon 1.2 And to our beloved Aphia and Archippus, our fellow soldier, and to the church in thy house. Where we assemble should not be of any significance, but what many are truly angry about is that we do not partake in their traditions. This exposes their man-made doctrines, quote, of faith and practice, for what they are, a sideshow mixture of unbiblical rituals and arrogant religious pride. I pray that all who have been deceived by these vain and worldly practices will repent and return to the simplicity that is in Christ Jesus alone. Colossians 2.8 Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit, after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. 2 Corinthians 11.3 But I fear lest by any means, as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, so your minds should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. Time for your eye to God!